Thanks for joining me today as I explore intercultural communication in migration law practice, sharing results from my ongoing research. Navigating migration procedures in Australia and other countries of the global north can be hugely challenging. Migration law and procedure are incredibly complex and restrictive and the rules are constantly changing, some almost on a daily basis. Processes are also linguistically demanding. Making sense of the law itself and then navigating the application process requires a very high level of proficiency in written legal English and strong computer literacy. Depending on the type of application, individuals may also need to attend an interview and discuss personal and sometimes sensitive parts of their life in great detail, uh, sometimes as a way to prove that they are credible. These processes are inherently a site of intercultural communication in multiple ways. First, perhaps most obviously, in the sense that different participants, more often than not, will come from different national, ethnic, racial and or linguistic backgrounds. Second, the Immigration Department and its officials have their own specific bureaucratic culture and that will most likely be unfamiliar and can be challenging for visa applicants to interact with. So while the Australian Immigration Department advises that applicants are permitted to apply for a visa on their own, having professional assistance can often be crucial to a smooth and successful application. In Australia, two groups of people can assist the vi with visa applications or with first stage appeals for a rejected application. Practicing lawyers can provide assistance and for non-lawyers to assist, they must complete a graduate diploma in migration law, pass some external examinations, and then they can register as a migration agent. However, there has been very little research about Australian migration lawyers and registered migration agents, who together I'll call migration practitioners. From my own past research on language in refugee pr procedures, I found that official guidelines and decisions also pay little attention to the role that practitioners play in shaping the refugee narrative and in mediating communication. Yet research suggests that practitioners influence application processes and institutional communication in many different ways. So my current project sought to explore practitioners' beliefs and practices when it comes to communicating with or on behalf of their clients. And today I'd like to reflect more closely on the different ways that intercultural communication comes up in discourses about migration processes and about migration practitioners. To do this, I start by paraphrasing Ingrid Capilla's key question to ask, who makes language and culture relevant to whom, in which context and for which purposes? So based on these questions, I argue that different stakeholders in the migration space present intercultural communication in conflicting ways placing different participants' language and culture under the spotlight in different ways with varying emphasis on context. These different understandings can then form the basis for justifying or for challenging particular existing laws and practices. While there is room for middle ground and overlaps, at their extremes, these different representations view intercultural communication as a risk that needs controlling or, on the other hand, an opportunity to mobilise special skills. So to explore these questions and to unpack these different representations, I drew on a range of data. I started with an analysis of law and policy related texts to better understand the official discourses around migration practitioners and communication in migration practice, to contextualise their belief development and to understand the constraints under which they worked or work. I also interviewed currently practicing migration lawyers and agents. And after this, I started researching with students enrolled in the Graduate Diploma of Migration Law and Practice. I sought to understand the students' backgrounds and motivations for pursuing a career in migration and explore their learning experiences as well. Wherever possible, I conducted multiple interviews with these individuals to map how their experiences 
beliefs and practices evolved over time. In parallel, I also observed a number of online workshops offered to students throughout their study, targeting their client interview skills. Students are given some hypothetical scenarios uh, to, to participate in role plays where they are a migration agent conducting a consultation with a client. I offered individual debriefing and feedback to participants and further reflection and debriefing also formed part of the focus in the individual research interviews. During the same period, I collaborated with teaching staff to embed sociolinguistic research expertise within the, le the, the learning materials and activities offered, offered to students. Including migration agents alongside lawyers in the study was a valuable opportunity. Compared with lawyers, who as a whole group do not reflect the diversity of the Australian population as a whole, registered migration agents in Australia are a very culturally and linguistically diverse group. From the statistics that are available, we can estimate that one, over half of currently practicing migration agents are migrants themselves, that they've either migrated to Australia as adults or perhaps at a younger age, and so they have their own first-hand experience of the Australian migration process. Secondly, almost half of the students within UTS's graduate diploma report, report that English is not their first language. And anyone who has done any type of undergraduate degree can do this qualification. And so the students also bring to their work diverse pre-existing qualifications and work experience. And so what this means is that migration agents have a valuable and diverse set of linguistic skills, personal migration experiences, and additional professional skills that have the potential to enrich their work. Yet current practitioners also gave me insights into the challenges that they face in their day-to-day -day work, painting a picture of just how difficult it can be to meet clients' needs and to manage their expectations while navigating increasingly restricted and inaccessible processes. And here a focus on contexts and interactions uh, was key. So practitioners made sense of the challenges that they faced by pointing to the changing land landscape of legal frameworks and institutional practices. For example, they pointed to the ever-changing and increasingly restricted visa options as a key difficulty. They need to constantly stay up to date with changes to migration law, but also need to manage their clients' expectations. So carefully, carefully balancing different professional goals. On the one hand, they need to emphasize their professional skills and knowledge and therefore the value that they can offer their clients. But then on the other hand, they also need to make sure that their clients understand that they can't actually determine the outcome of an application and that in fact they are limited by what the law is and whether there actually is a relevant visa option for a particular individual and in their situation. As visa options become increasingly limited, this can actually be very difficult for clients to accept and it gets harder for practitioners to demonstrate their value while not overpromising. Another key challenge is the official channels through which practitioners and applicants can communicate with the immigration department. And these have been trending towards ever decreasing accessibility. For example, participants explained how in the past each visa application was assigned an individual departmental case officer uh, who had a name and a direct email address and a telephone number. So if practitioners needed to ask a question about the application or send an update, they could contact that person directly, quickly and easily. This is no longer the case. Now instead, there are only general contact details for departments as a whole or sections of the department as a whole. And they provide general inquiries or responses to general inquiries only. Practitioners have no way of directly contacting uh, any individual decision maker anymore with any specific queries. And so this places severe limits on their access and agency. And in fact, one participant talks about how she keeps an Excel sheet with old individual contact details in it from the previous way of doing things and that she uses that to just try and reach out to people directly, hoping that they'll be receptive to her phone calls. So what once upon a time was standard practice, that list of contacts has now become a treasured 
uh, rare resource in her work and not something that newer practitioners would be able to rely on. Finally, these challenges overlap with another, and that is that practitioners are more tightly regulated now than they ever have been before. And some report feeling a great deal of stress and even fear in this regard. So my analysis of government discourse goes far in uh, starting to explain this trend and also clearly demonstrates a divergent representation of intercultural communication. So earlier I mentioned that one particular view led to an emphasis on risk that needs controlling and so I'd like to expand on that briefly here. I examined the most recent parliamentary inquiry into the regulation of the migration profession to find out how government actors view practitioners and their work. Here, key policy problems are the threat that migration practitioners pose in terms of their competence and ethics, and the need to protect their clients who are vulnerable. A key trend in the inquiry report was the theme of criminality, and it included terms like crime, illegitimate, exploit, unscrupulous and unlawful, all in connection with migration practi practitioners. And this was contrasted with a discourse of vulnerability in relation to clients, where a whole chapter is actually entitled Vulnerable Victims. And it emphasizes uh, that they come from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds. And they say that they are socially, legally, and financially vulnerable and are open to exploitation from the actions of unscrupulous, unlawful, and unethical registered migration agents. So the two, so the official institutional discourse has a heavy focus on these two groups of individual participants and the particular types of deficiencies um, that they're supposed to bring to migration processes. So instead of focusing on the complex legal structures and procedures that arguably exacerbate or could even create many of the difficulties and vulnerabilities that people experience, these types of discourses place the spotlight and the blame on migration practitioners, justifying tighter and tighter regulation. They also make language and culture individually salient for migrants and present them as reasons for vulnerability. Where some submissions to that inquiry actually drew attention to structural issues, these concerns were minimized and not retained in the committee's conclusions and recommendations. Um, and this is in line with this focus on individual deficit and risk. I've written about this process extensively in an article published in Discourse and Society for anyone who's interested. Uh, so all in all, practitioners identify and make sense of their work-related challenges by contextualizing them within the legal, procedural and regulatory frameworks in which they operate while for the institutional discourses, practitioner behaviour and the vulnerability of linguistically and culturally diverse migrants are policy problems that require close scrutiny and control. And yet language becomes salient in other ways too. So this time connected with migration practitioners, one of the rules aims at controlling and excluding incompetent and unethical practitioners and it connects directly with English language proficiency. So I found that the rules for proving English language proficiency are problematic and potentially discriminatory in what they require from different individuals. So if we take the example of two of the students in my research, we can see clearly how this problem emerges. So one particular student is a multilingual person who grew who migrated to Australia based on his professional skills. He grew up in India, uh, where he spoke a family language at home, a regional language in his community, um, but in fact, all of his schooling from the beginning of primary school right until the end of his university was in English, and strictly so. So strict to the point that the students would be punished if they were caught speaking any other language, even in the playground during lunchtime. Not being a Hindi speaker, he used English as a lingua franca during work travel, even while in India, and also later when he spent time working overseas. And then of course, throughout all his work in various professional contexts in Australia. Proving his English language proficiency was also a requirement for his own skilled permanent visa, and also access to his graduate diploma education. 
He reports that his migration and travel experiences have given him the opportunity to develop an awareness of different ways of speaking English and also other languages and allowed him to become a confident intercultural communicator. Another student I interviewed is a monolingual English speaker who was born in Australia. He too had all of his education in English and has had some limited opportunities to learn a little bit of a couple of languages other than English as an adult in his spare time. He spent his whole working life in Australia and has had limited opportunities to develop his intercultural communication skills uh, in his work experience. While he speaks fluent English and is a really friendly and engaging person uh, and it was a great participant in the role plays that I observed. On a number of occasions in those role plays, he used Australian English idioms that his role play partners actually didn't understand and this affected their interaction. To become a migration, a registered migration agent, both of these individuals must successfully complete the graduate diploma and then take two externally administered um, written and oral exams and those exams are actually specifically designed to test the occup occupational competencies required of a migration agent and this includes their profession specific communication skills. Yet only one of these individuals is assumed to have sufficient English language proficiency for their work and that's based on where he's lived and the other surprise, surprise, must take an IELTS exam again to prove again that he has adequate English to work as a migration agent. So here, language and migration history become salient to who legislators think can be competent and trustworthy practitioners. These rules assume that coming from a multilingual background and a particular country of origin are potential threats to one's English language proficiency and further that ensuring English language proficiency is a way of ensuring competent and ethical practice and protection of vulnerable clients. And again I've spoken and written about these language proficiency requirements elsewhere so if you're interested in this issue I encourage you to go So in contrast to this hyper visibility uh, and importance of English language proficiency and its connection with ensuring practitioner competence and ethical practice, other language skills and practices are much less visible in official discourses about migration practitioners. This qu contrasts quite dramatically with how current practitioners actually report doing their work and how students report that they plan to do their work where participants identify a range of valuable communication skills beyond English proficiency that are crucial to doing their job well. So for example, while proficiency in English is the only official language requirement to work as a migration practitioner, in reality, many practitioners use other languages in their day-to-day -day work across different modes of communication with different clients. All current practitioners in my study who had English as a second language reported using other languages with at least some of their clients. Some serve almost exclusively clients from the same language background or country of origin, while others have more diverse client groups. A number of participants had also established or were planning to establish additional offices in other countries to serve particular client groups too. This is obviously very important. The Australian immigration regime is almost completely officially monolingual Law and policy are published in English only. All application paperwork must be completed in English. Applicants are sim simply expected to figure this out regardless of their own linguistic resources. And so pra practitioners use languages other than English to facilitate their clients' interactions with the department in ways that benefit both the department and the visa applicants. So having practitioners who can communicate in more than one language fills a very important and substantial structural communication gap. Both monolingual and multilingual practitioners also describe the importance of mobilising other types of intercultural communication skills in their work. They identify this as important for building trust and rapport and crucial to providing advice and taking instructions from their clients. They talk about being aware 
of and managing linguistic issues when working with interpreters, for example, or when different speakers are using different varieties of a language. They talk about what they do to check and address issues with understanding. They also describe how they may use strategies like switching between different languages for different parts of their interaction to best suit their clients' needs. For example, they might provide a written advice document in English, but then follow up with an oral explanation or a written explanation in an email or via instant messenger using another language uh, to supplement this official written version in English. Code choice and code uh, switching are also discussed in the context of performing a professional identity and in rapport building as well. Practitioners also describe their awareness and use of different communication styles and norms to meet the needs of their various clients such as, for example, having uh, set office hours and face-to-face -face meetings for some clients, but then also speaking to others after hours uh, via the phone, for example. Relevant sociocultural knowledge is also highly valued. So those who have a migrant background themselves point to their lived experience and insider knowledge as important assets in interacting with and representing their clients. And also practitioners who don't identify a shared background with their clients also value this type of knowledge and they stress the need to develop an understanding of their clients, country of origin, ethnic, linguistic and other social groups uh, through the course of their work. And navigating different types of interpersonal and power dynamics can also be more challenging and complex than official discourses envisage. For example, one young non-white female practitioner shares her experiences assisting clients who are high powered CEOs of transnational companies. And here the power dynamic is not at all the one that's envisaged by institutional discourses. And she must carefully balance her professional duties as a practitioner with maintaining good relationships with the client companies who can be very demanding at times. And also with her managers who closely scrutinize and control every detail of her interactions with clients. So therefore, I argue that migration practitioners actually carry out substantial and important invisible language work that much of the institutional discourse does not explicitly recognize and sometimes even is discursively transformed into a threat rather than a benefit. I'd also like to highlight how practical experience and education can help transform future practitioners' understandings of their work um, and to help help them to value their own skills. So one student uh, who participated reflected on how uh, being part of the role plays helped build her confidence. English is her second language uh, and she describes herself as a nervous person when it comes to speaking or speaking in public. I also remember her being quite hesitant when it came to deciding whether to participate in my research uh, when she was a new student. And we had a lot of back and forth by email before she decided she wanted to participate. Early in her study, uh, she told me the first time uh, I participated in a role play, I didn't even turn on the camera, the video, because I just thought, if I don't see anyone's there, I can pretend, okay, I'm just talking in the dark to myself. So you can see how nervous I was compared uh, to the more recent a role play she's discussing. But this time we have the camera on, so that's an improvement for me. So slowly she developed her confidence and not only did this expand her ability to participate in class, but I think very significantly, uh, her confidence also expanded her career plans. So in her first research interview with me, she talked about not wanting to work with vulnerable clients. Um, yeah, I think that they're the terms that she used. So for example, we were talking about working with asylum seekers and she said that she didn't feel confident to assist people who may have um, had traumatic experiences. But at the end of her study, when we spoke again, uh, she had passed her external oral exam with confidence and said that she actually had a great time chatting with the examiner. And while awaiting her registration uh, process, she applied for work experience with an organization that specifically assists refugees. 
And she attributes this gain in confidence uh, to the formative experiences that she had throughout her study. Student participants also shared critical reflections on uh, the migration profession registration rules. So for example, many raised the issue of assessment design, arguing that these time restricted, very difficult external exams don't reflect the nature of the real work environment that doesn't have those types of uh, very, very tight timings. And others raised issues uh, around the need to take English language tests multiple times in their lives and question why test results expired after two years and why they needed to take them again and again, or else why academic IELTS was a requirement for migration practice when the tests aren't at all designed to test the skills and knowledge needed uh, to be a migration practitioner. Other students also developed a sense of the bad reputation that migration agents seem to have amongst uh, government departments and policymakers. And so while some seem to embrace the idea that more stringent entry requirements would help prevent dodgy agents, others regarded this much more critically. And one explained uh, this by suggesting that there was some kind of link between migrants and migration agents in that discourse. And he said, I think they see us as unnecessary because I think they are very anti-immigration and I don't think they really care for anybody helping migrants whatsoever. I just think that the government's deliberately making it difficult for people to get into the profession. So where does this leave our understanding of intercultural communication in migration law practice? Undoubtedly, migration practitioners play complex and important roles in assisting people applying for Australian visas, mobilising a range of sociolinguistic resources in the process. Yet there is a huge variation in how their contributions are viewed based on diverging ways of making language and culture salient in this setting. As I've argued, on the one hand, official discourses present intercultural communication uh, with a focus on particular individuals, migration practitioners become risks that need managing and clients are vulnerable. On the other hand, the research uncovers considerable counter discourses from current and future practitioners who value their own skills and suggest that legal and procedural structures should be the target of greater scrutiny. Happily, my research suggests that students learning experiences can also help equip them to have confidence in their own professional capabilities and to develop this critical focus on broader context. And also fortunately, there has been a recent change of government in Australia and with this, there have been a number of reforms announced acknowledging some of these big structural issues within the migration system. This creates an excellent opportunity for improvements to be made so that migration practitioners and the clients that they serve can have a more positive and empowering experience. Thanks very much for listening to me. I'm sad that I couldn't be there in person today, but if you'd like to, please stay in touch. And these are the best ways of getting in touch with me. And because I can't be there today to participate live, I invite you to join me to ask any further questions or continue the discussion on languageonthemove.com.